Hello to you, tabletop enthusiast. I'm Celine, brand and community manager for Game on Tabletop, the crafting platform for gamers by gamers. I am back with a new video for our series where we interview different actors from the board game and the crafting industry. Today, we will be talking with John Brigger, who is a board game developer. Hello, John. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm recording here in Maine on the East Coast of the United States, which is been great so far. Can you tell us a bit about yourself? I think you have a background in qualitative research and you've worked for Apple. So how did you end up working in the board game industry? I'm John Brieger. I run the Brieger Creative Studio, which is a board game development studio based in Sunnydale, California. We help publishers take games from prototype to product, is what we like to say. And that covers things like development, gameplay streamlining, playtesting programs, content design, sometimes production, art direction. Before I made board games for a living, I worked in the tech industry designing retail stores, uh, specifically interactive installations and the experiences that customers have when they, they come into an Apple store. And that involved both a lot of user experience design as well as field research where we're going into stores watching customers go through different journeys in the store, maybe testing a new experience in the store. And when I started working on board games, it was a, something on the side in addition to my normal job. And a lot of those skills of watching customers go through experiences and using that to iterate the experience sort of transferred over in the area of playtesting, watching people play a game and figuring out how to use their experience of the play to make the game better. And that was the part of making games that always really appealed to me. So while I do sometimes design games, I think that playtesting is really at the heart of, of everything that I do and everything that the studio does. So now, can you tell me what is exactly development for board games? That is a tricky concept to nail down. Uh, I generally like to think of it as refining the game for its intended audience after the publisher has sort of seen a path to the market. And the line between what is development and what is design is very tricky. Most of what we do as developers is design work, but we're doing it at a different stage than the original designer of the game would be doing it in. And in very rare cases, uh, we are you know, doing sort of core design work on a game, often in the, the form of sequels or expansions, we'll be doing a little more design work as part of the development. And for me, when you're a designer, you're sort of designing a more abstract sort of best game. So you have some vision of, of what the game is that you want to be making and maybe who it's for, and you're keeping that audience in mind. But once a publisher has signed that game from you, then there's a very concrete audience that you're trying to reach because that publisher has a brand, they have their own marketing channels, whether it's through crowdfunding or through retail. And now you need to refine that game with its final theme, with the artwork and uh, aesthetic that the publishers decided to pair it with for the audience that the publisher has. And that might include making changes to the complexity of the game, either more complex or less complex, depending on the audience. That might mean adding a solo mode because it's going to a, an audience that really would desire a solo mode for the game or expanding the player count. Maybe the game came in two to four players and we really think that it could reach more families if it could play up to five. Those are the kinds of challenges that uh, developers can meet. And I find there's often a misconception that development and especially developmental playtesting is all about smoothing out the bugs in a game. And we do absolutely do that. We test the games exhaustively. We try to find edge cases. We try to find places where the rules are a little rough and make the games flow smoother and be more approachable and more easy to learn. But it's also about finding what are the things that the audience finds the most fun in the game and can we make more of those moments? Can we help, help the audience have more fun with the game? So I sort of refer to that as adding texture to a game a little bit. How does working with a developer help with the overall cost in production? One of the things that I find useful as a developer is really knowing materials and understanding the production flow of a game. And it's something that I encourage every designer to learn as much about as they can. We, we have the final sort of bill of materials for a game, 
we can start looking at ways to optimize those components. So what tokens could be printed front back of each other? Does this need to be a piece of cardstock or a punch board or something different? And it's not necessarily just about saving cost and making the publisher more money or less money or you know maximizing profits in some weird capitalist scheme. When you can lower the price of a game enough that you can lower the MSRP, you're making a game more accessible to more people. And to me, that's what I view cutting costs and cutting components as is a way of making games more accessible to a wider audience. You know, the $20 games that you can find at a large retailer are going to reach more people than a $60 hobby game most of the time. And how can we work to make our games as accessible as possible to the most people? I That's something that always intrigues me, and that's sort of the lens that I approach component reduction through. And is it always necessary to work with a developer? No, um, I, I don't think it's necessary to work with a developer every time, as much as I don't want to talk myself out of a job. I really think that you have to figure out where in your process, if you're a, a publisher or a self-publisher and you're, you're listening to this, a developer fits. Are they someone that comes in at the end? Are they someone that comes in early and sort of helps advise you across your whole product line? Are they none of those things? Some de designers polish their games much further before they take them to publishers than others. And I think you as a publisher will know how complete a game is when you play it from the rules without the designer there, you can get a good sense of how, how finished this thing is. Uh, and as a, a consequence of that, the products that we end up assigned to as developers do tend to be more complex products, whether that's really big games with lots of systems or sometimes small games, a game like Cartographers, which is has a lot of content that needs development and needs playtesting, even though it's a, a small, a, you know, more approachable game. At which stage do you add a developer to a team? Generally, we like to be added to a team when there's a clear vision for the product and the game is completely playable. So we like to make sure that the designer has finished their, their design work and has taken it you know, as far or almost as far as they can take it without an additional set of eyes. And then we can come in as a fresh perspective representing the publisher and, and representing the audience and uh, work through our process. There's no one set stage where you have to hire a developer, but the later you hire, the less impact and change we're going to be able to have. So for example, if you've already run your crowdfunding campaign and you have renders of a bunch of your miniatures on the product page, you can't then change the number of plastic miniatures in a box. Uh, so that's something you promised to your audience. So if we came in and say, actually, it would be better if we had three types of miniatures, but only 12 total instead of 18 miniatures, but two types, that's a change you couldn't make if you hired us after the crowdfunding campaign. And that's something you're gonna to have to consider too, is what do you want your developer to do? It is a very flexible role if you're a publisher and finding out where they fit in your process and where they fit in your workflow is gonna be different. And the way that I work with different publishing clients is very different for uh, a client like Thunderworks Games who makes cartographers and the role player series. I work on a project by project basis, not necessarily on, on all the games and we come in you know, after a pretty significant amount of design work has been done. For a client like BoardGameTables.com, we actually work on a retainer basis and we uh, have a set number of hours that we work with them every month. And then when we need a really big project, we'll, we'll spin it off separately. So you as a publisher can find your own best relationship with your developers. And I don't think that that's a problem or there's one right way to do it. Do you have tips on development for creators with a smaller budget? For creators with a, a smaller budget, and I think that's that's something I maybe should have said about all my advice, is I work mostly on games that are intended to be commercial products for sale by companies intending to make a profit. And 
that is not the only way to make a game or the only reason to make a game. Lots of my favorite games I have been uh, part of as a player have been games made for special events or for a specific audience or released as a, a project because it, it's a piece of art that the designer cares quite a lot about. So don't ever feel like you have to hire a development team just because they exist and it is a thing that you can do. If you're on a smaller budget, something you can do is hire a developer as a consultant. Not all developers are available to do this. I often am, am not, and my team generally does not do a lot of consulting, but that maybe your developer is gonna play your game two or three times and just give you some advice about where you might take it. And rather than do the development and make changes, run more play tests, you're not gonna get a full cycle out of that engagement but you'll get some direction that you can take back into your own process because I'm assuming as a publisher or designer, you probably do run some tests of your own. You know, it's very rare to have a, a designer or a publisher that's not play testing and, and running game. How do you know when a game is ready for production? I honestly don't know that you can. Uh, no game is, is ever finished. It's only ever published. That's uh, what I have heard quite a bit from others. And we often look at how much is changing test to test, how happy are players about the game, how much do they want to play it again or ask to see it when we, you know, we move them on to some other game. We often will use the same players but have them play different games across many tests. And those are indicators but not necessarily, oh, once you hear that, the game's done. You have to know for yourself, and I think it is different for every project, you know, how tight and complete you need a game, an abstract game, you know, like a chess or Onatama is very different than the amount of tightness you need on a role-playing game product. And only, only you know, you just have to know it when you see it, unfortunately. Do you sometimes suggest expansion ideas to creators, even if they are not planned? Yes, uh, Breeder Creative actually specializes in what we call expansions and line extensions. These are things that are carrying a product line forward for a publisher. So in the example of Cartographers, we had Cartographers Heroes, which is a standalone sequel, or recently we had Kabuto Sumo, and we developed the base game and then actually designed the expansion for the game that was offered as part of the crowdfunding campaign uh, in-house as part of the development process. So uh, that goes back to that point about audience. I really feel like development is all about audience. So when we look at a game, we suggest expansions when we feel they're appropriate for the audience. And often as part of a crowdfunding campaign, we're looking at ways to uh, stretch the, the pledge levels so that we can appeal to multiple audiences. Maybe the, there are those people who want to go more all in and are ready to sort of spend for a premium product. And there are people who are really just there to get the base game. So sometimes we're looking at expansions. We also might be looking at things like deluxe component upgrades or add-ons, play mats. We look at sort of the product cohesively as a, as a whole line when we go through the development process. What would be your advice to a creator to map out a long time plan for a game with expansions? It's easy to bite off more than you can chew with expansions. And I think it's important to really limit yourself to look at the expansions that you're going to produce as part of your initial offering, whether it's a crowdfunding campaign, retail, pre-order. So for me personally, that tends to be one, maybe two expansions plus the base game. If your base game isn't released, I think it is a mistake to plan more than you know two expansions ahead unless you have something really, really big with an enormous, enormous marketing budget behind it. I'm thinking on the scale of something like Keyforge from Fantasy Flight Games. That's maybe okay to plan a couple expansions ahead because you're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars in marketing. Uh, for most of us in the board gaming industry, you aren't sure how the market is going to receive your base game and maybe even how they're going to receive your first expansion. So we try not to put the cart before the horse, as, as they say. So uh, to use uh, cartographers as an example, during the development of the base game of cartographers, we made a mini expansion, the skills expansion. And 
then we had some ideas for some some further material but we waited until the base game was released into retail to see what the demand was and see the reception before going ahead and and pushing for more material the downside of that was at the time that cartographers was designed the designer jory adan uh is a brilliant brilliant designer uh he was just working independently in between when the game was designed and when the game was released he was hired full time to work for simon and wasn't then available to design the expansion so there's always a little bit of a trade off you know you have to think about your availability as a as a publisher your availability as a as a designer if you're the designer of the game i often as a personal designer when i sign contracts to publishers i sort of say i want the first chance to work on an expansion but i don't want my availability let's say i was just too busy on some other project to block you from making an expansion that you need to be made so uh they have the ability generally to make an expansion without me and i just get a lower royalty on that expansion and you know that happens sometimes generally as developers when we work on expansions we always make sure that the designer sort of has the first chance to to work on those things so if they're not available or can't work on it or don't want to work on it then we we work on those expansions do you also work on their rulebook and if you do what is the most common mistake made there uh we do work on on quite a bit of rulebook editing and and structure as part of our development work we tend not to hire ourselves out as editors only we only work on editing for games in which we are also part of gameplay development and sometimes uh we also work with an external editor as well so we'll do a developmental edit and then we'll have an external ed editor come in and, and clean things up and that is still worth it if you are a publisher i still think it's worth hiring a developer and an editor totally totally worth your money your rule book is the mo most 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 important part of the component you're going to ship with your game uh common mistakes that we see are explaining things out of order so introducing a concept and says well when you round the barn but you haven't explained what rounding the barn means in your game or whatever that thing is so introducing things out of sequence and the other thing is rule books that concentrate too much on telling you what you cannot do uh because generally if the the space of a written rule book it just is telling you the things you can do within the systems of a game so if i say you can't pick up the table flip it over and stomp on it i don't need to put that in the rule book because i never told you elsewhere in the rule book that you can flip the table and stomp on it and i often see uh you know maybe somebody asked this as a a question can i do this and someone puts it in their rule book because someone some playtest or asked about it at some point but broadly i don't think rules are there to tell you what you can't do rules are tell there to tell you what you can do and if you cover every one of those can't do cases your rule book just gets longer and longer and longer i'm a big believer that every line of text you put in your rule book is like a little hurdle in a in a hurdle race that your players have to jump over so each line you add is a tiny tiny bit of barrier to accessibility so the shorter and most clear you can make your rule book better. You've mentioned that you should look for a single change that will solve a lot of issues rather than adding a lot of content in a lot of different areas of the game. Do you maybe have an example of where you've made a small change but it had a huge impact? Uh, one of the things that I am always looking for is systems that affect other parts of the game and being able to make changes that solve those multiple issues. So when we look for the way we an analyze a game, we try not to just make a bullet point list of all the feedback and then apply a, a fix to each of those things because you often will end up with weird little bolted on tacked on portions of your game that only exist to solve one minor thing in in playtesting. So uh, a good example of one change that affects a lot of things was when we were working on Lockup which is a, an auction worker placement game you have a a series of areas around the board where you're placing numbered tiles and like an auction whoever has the highest numbers total numbers at each place is going to win the reward for that that place and 
we were seeing two really big things. One was there wasn't as much competition as we would like, especially at lower player counts on the number of, uh, on the, the auctions for each location. And the other was that the game had a unique mechanism called raids, where the guards in this prison would grow suspicious of you and they would come and, and raid you, you, and they would raid the players that had the most suspicion. And at the time, there were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, there were eight rooms on the board, uh, or sort of nine. Uh, and one of them allowed you to return suspicion to the guards. It was the guard room. And what we realized was if we cut returning suspicion from the guard room as a core feature of the game, that you could go there and you could do that every turn, and we put returning suspicion into other existing systems of the game, you know, when you're buying, uh, it's a game in which you can recruit people and buy items. So we, we put some stuff there. Uh, we got to do a bunch of things at once. We could... Uh, tighten up the the suspicion and the raids and make it a little uh, more of a lasting impact and we could tighten up the competition for the auctions because while you had the same number of pieces going out they were going out to a fewer total number of locations so you had more competition at each space and that's the kind of solution that that we're always looking for I always view design as having a lot of trade-offs so you know, another way we could have increased competition would have been to add more pieces that players placed out so that you had uh, more total pieces on the board. But each time you go around the table with each player placing a piece, that increases the length of the game. So uh, having a solution that didn't increase length and also solve this other issue is better than sort of the easiest first thing you might reach for when you say, oh, there's not enough uh, pieces in each space. Do you have examples of unique marketable features you have developed that weren't in the game originally? This is something we, we always look for when we, we take in development projects and we want to try to spend some time with a game before we suggest changes like this. For Kabuto Sumo, the game came to us as all discs from the designer Tony Miller. And it was already this incredible, super fun game where you pushed discs into a, a round table and you were trying to push your opponent's disc off the edge. And whatever you pushed out that wasn't, you know, your opponent's uh, would come to you and that would be what you could push next. And had this really wonderful little economy and strategy. But we looked at it and it was a very abstract game with a sort of a loose beetle sumo theme. And we thought a lot about how we could add character and add some theme integration really into the core of the gameplay and we came up with what we called the signature moves which are uniquely shaped pieces themed to a special wrestler with an asymmetric character so now we're introducing sort of two layers of theming you have the character that sits in front of you who are you in this game you know you are mighty jaw mike uh the stag beetle and you have the mandible jaw piece that looks like a beetle's jaws. And because it is a physics-based game, the shapes of those pieces have all sorts of interesting physics ramifications for the gameplay. So we also got to spend a ton of time developing and iterating and testing different shapes and different ways of using those pieces to accomplish those signature moves. And that for me was it's an incredible, incredible opportunity because for many people who are now buying that game, it's it's just released now after a successful crowdfunding campaign, they couldn't even conceive of that game without the wrestlers and without the, the idea of that theme applied to it. And it fits so perfectly with Tony's vision for the game as a designer, and it felt like a, a natural extension of that. How do you design content, especially for crowdfunding audiences? And how do you get a game ready for crowdfunding? Designing games for crowdfunding is, I think, tricky. Uh, you have to know where your audience is within the segments of crowdfunding very specifically, and whether you're intending to try to bring a lot of new people to the crowdfunding platform, or you're trying to appeal to sort of the core board game crowdfunding audience that already exists on these sites. 
As an example, recently we worked on a game called Catastrophe, and this is a lighthearted party family game featuring famous cats from Instagram. And we knew that the majority of the audience for this game wasn't already on crowdfunding sites. So we spent a lot of time doing outreach. We uh, had you know cross promotional posts with the Instagram cats. And when we looked at our content design for what was gonna be in the crowdfunding campaign, we had to make sure that we were really explaining what are stretch goals? What is the idea of unlocking more content as the campaign gets bigger? And in another campaign, you might just put a graphic up that says stretch goals and people who came to that page would already know what that, that term meant. Uh, for game miniatures games, you know, something like we worked on uh, Batman the Animated Series Adventures uh, with IDW, that's an audience that really responds to additional content and unlocks and they put a lot of value and worth into the stretch goal and being part of a stretch goals of a campaign in a way that an audience for a more casual game might not and i don't i'm not a believer that stretch goals are always necessary or that there's only one right way to run a crowdfunding campaign i think it's more about understanding your audience and uh, appealing to their expectations more than than anything else getting a game ready for crowdfunding is its own process. There's not only all the marketing and, and promotional work that you're gonna have to do, but you have to think carefully about your game's content and how you might wanna divide that content up into multiple SKUs or pledge levels. So it's, I don't think disingenuous to look at your game cohesively. What is the maximum product you wanna deliver if you had a you know an unlimited budget? and then start sort of working your way down from there. And you never want to present your minimum product, what's there day one of the campaign without any stretch goals. That needs to be a fun and functional and complete game. You can't really you know, strip stuff out of it, but it's okay and I think better as a developer and as a designer to design everything at once rather than designing them in pieces that get added on because you want the final product when it all comes together to be cohesive and to feel like it all fits together. So I'm a big believer, we develop almost every stretch goal that is in every one of our campaigns 100% in advance of that campaign, unless it involves some sort of backer created content or contributed content from the, from the crowdfunding campaign. We try to design everything in advance and I have seen from some backers that they they see that as a little cynical of, oh, you know, why is this already done when you said it wouldn't be done until we got $200,000? But I think that is what makes for the strongest game and for the strongest product is working on it cohesively. And I think the, the results of that speak for themselves. It also is less chance that the product gets delayed because you're developing a ton of content after the Kickstarter campaign or crowdfunding campaign. What would be your advice on add-ons and stretch goals for crafting companies? We work quite a bit on, on stretch goal content and add-on content. I am a, a big believer that you want your stretch goals to add value. And I think it's hard sometimes because creators feel a pressure from backers of crowdfunding campaigns to just add things, add anything that you know, everything, you know, we have 35 unlocks on this campaign. And I really try to challenge the publishers I work with to make sure that everything you're adding is making the experience of the game better for players. And you're not just saying, oh, well, we started with thinner cardboard than we ever would actually want to print. We made that cardboard thicker. You know, really challenge yourself to make a, a premium, great product at your base level and then add to it things that are, are truly adding value for, for your backers. Working on add-ons especially, or stretch goal unlocks that add, allow additional purchases, people want to give creators their money. Uh, they want to support you. They want to be part of the process of making the game. They want to be part of a community that contributes to the game. And I sometimes see creators afraid and I'm sometimes afraid myself of oh you know the max pledge level for my game is over a hundred dollars and you know why would someone give me 
a hundred dollars. And I think sometimes it's a confidence thing. It's it's different for small creators than it is for someone, you know, like a, a Simon. But people want to support you. And when you're making additional add-ons to add to your campaign, there is a logistical problem of, of making additional SKUs. But I I don't want creators to be cynical of, oh, people will think I'm just doing this for cash or, or whatever. The backers are there to support you and support your vision. And if you're giving them something that increases their enjoyment of the game, that's great. And you shouldn't feel guilty about providing that or giving it to them. So I am always looking when I am signed on to projects for where are the opportunities for potential add-ons or deluxe components? What makes the most sense to be a deluxe component? Is it really going to push the experience of the game further or is it just you know, sort of a, a waste of space. Um, not every game needs a board that's replaced with a playmat. Some games, the playmat is a wonderful addition, and some games, it's really not necessary. Um, and you have to figure out, out that for yourself by really looking at your own game and figuring out what are the best products that are fits for it. Was the last question, would you like to add something? I think my, my biggest piece of advice for creators is Always be thinking about who your audience is and who are the people who are going to be playing your game, who are going to be purchasing your game, and keeping them in mind when you're developing new features or add-ons or stretch goals or whatever it is that you're working on, whether it's core game or additional products. It's all about your audience. And if you're ever struggling or trying to make a decision it's always good to put it in front of people, whether that's real players or your peers in the publishing and design communities. I have gotten so much help and so much advice and so much mentorship from other designers and developers and publishers. And I think this is a community that's really good about trying to pay that forward and, and advise people and help people. And now, if a viewer is interested to work with you on development, where can they find you? If you're a publisher who's interested in potentially working with Breaker Creative or you're a designer or a developer or someone who's interested in those roles and you just want to chat, please reach out to me. There's a contact form on our website, BreakerCreative.com. That's B-R-I-E-G-E-R -E -E Creative.com. Or you can find me on Twitter at Das Breaker, D-A-S-B-R-I-E-G-E-R. -E -E well, thank you so much for being with us today. Bye-bye. And that's it for today's interview on board game development. I hope you enjoyed this video. Make sure to like, comment and subscribe to our channel to follow all the cropping adventures. Don't forget to check out GameOnTabletop.com to discover great tabletop cropping companies. I'll see you soon in another video. Until then, bye bye!